Just to begin with, I'll uh, just introduce myself. My name is David Shevin, and I am the general manager of um, GIK Acoustics Europe. We started in Atlanta in the USA in 2004, and then opened up our first plant in Europe in Bradford in the UK about five years later, and now we've got sites in here in Germany, in Frankfurt, in Italy, and in France. We basically um, manufacture bass traps, diffusers, and acoustic treatments, and offer advice across a, a range of different platforms to people via our website. We do free acoustic advice. So the sort of places we've treated, we do auditoriums, we do restaurants, um, we do two-channel listening rooms, home cinema rooms, and we also work very strongly in the pro audio industry where we do live rooms and things like mixing and mastering rooms. We've done work all over the place. This is um, from the documentary on the Foo Fighters where it's in Austin City Limits. So what, what we're going to do today is go through some basic parts. So first of all, we're going to go through is why do you need room treatments? Then we're going to have a look at room setups. And then we'll have a look at four basic aspects of treating your room. When we go to treating your room like this, um, these are in an order that just suits me. All four aspects of it, the first reflections, the rear side walls, the back walls, and the corners are all as equally as important as each other. So why do we need room treatment and who needs it? We always talk about a story when we used to be in bands that we used to, uh, we used to do a thing called the van test. And it's where we'd record a song in our studio and we'd rush outside and we'd put it on in the van and it sounded absolutely awful and we couldn't understand why. And what it was, it was the room affecting the, the actual environment we were trying to make the song in. And what we did to demonstrate this, so you can get an idea of what we're talking about now, is we recorded the same piece of music on the same equipment in our Atlanta demo room. And on the first instance, there wasn't any acoustic treatment in the room. She got big, big lips, she got big eyes, she treats me right, she said, big surprise, she won't do that. She said she would, she needs to feel good, she needs to feel good. So what you can tell there is it was really echoey, it was really hard to tell anything in the low end. So what we did then is we did, we put our acoustic treatment into the room and recorded the same piece of music again. She got big red lips, she got big brown eyes, she treats me right, you said big surprise, she won't do anything, she said she would, she makes me feel good, she makes me feel good. So instantly you can tell the difference. And what it, and what it is, is it's taken away the flutter echo in the room, the vocals are no longer echoing, and there's a lot tighter in the low end so you could really hear the bass and the sounds. And that's ultimately why we look at treating rooms. It's, it's, you've got your good equipment, you've got it in there, but if it isn't set up right, then you can actually be uh, detrimental to your listening pleasure. So looking first of all at the room setup, before we advise anybody, we always have a look at the setup. And if it's possible, we ask them, can we, is there anything we can do to change? So here we are. You have to excuse that they've got control desks in these uh, little uh, demonstrations. Obviously, we originally wrote this for Pro Audio. But basically, the fundamental physics of it is exactly the same. So in this instance, this isn't how we'd want to set up a room. We want to put it here. So the first thing we're looking for, ideally, is you want to face the short wall. And the reason for this is, is actually pretty simple. The back wall, oops, the back wall here, it causes the majority of the problems in a room. This is where a lot of people hear about room modes. And this is the physics. Basically, as your speakers hit the back wall, all of the frequencies all the way through the range bounce back at you and it creates nulls and peaks. And that's where the sounds interfere with each other. So basically, to avoid that, what we're trying to do is get that back wall as far away from you as possible. Other things you need to look out for is symmetry. Imagine on this demonstration, obviously we cut away the wall, but imagine that at the back end was where the door was. So what we're looking for is symmetry, and symmetry is really important when setting up your speakers. Ideally, you have the same on the left side and the right side of you. So you're sat in your listening position. There isn't any windows, there isn't any doors. I, I appreciate this isn't possible for everyone, but this is, you know, we're talking about how we would like to set it up. So basically, what you're trying to look at is trying to get symmetry, because if you, if you go too far to the left, you've got different, different aspects to it. It messes up your stereo imaging, and it also creates problems in the low end. 
The other things, couple of things to work out, you may have heard of the golden rule, which is where people say sit at 38% into a room. That does apply, and it's, we would less call it a rule rather than a guide. That's somewhere to start with. The only place you really want to avoid is the middle of the room. You could sit on the back there at that sofa and you'd have the same um, good listening experience. The middle of the room, however, is where all those modes hit together. And the last thing to consider is, a last, is another thing we call a speaker boundary interference response, or you may see it called SBIR. And that's how do the speakers interact with the environment around them. What a lot of manufacturers say is bring them away from the wall. But really, if you've got a very big room, that's great. Because they really want you to get them away, away from the wall. Um, but most people have small rooms. So what we find is you're going to get an interference response. And what that means is the way that the sound coming out of the speakers is going to hit, react with the environment, the walls around it. So if you actually push those speakers closer to the wall, what you do is you actually change the interference and you change it from the low end, which is very hard to treat, and you bring it up. And if you can bring it up to 300, 400 hertz, then you're bringing it into the ambient noise of the room. It's a lot easier to treat. And it actually will, it can in some cases take away a lot of low end issues for people. So we've got our room set up right, we're all happy. Um, what we're going to look at next, we're going to look at place and room treatment. So I've started from the front of the room going backwards. So we're looking at early reflection points. Here we are, we're sat, at our, we're sat listening to our music. And what happens is, that first of all, we get the direct sound from the speakers. That hits us. And what we call that is we say that's um, zero milliseconds. So we call that the direct sound. When it hits us, that's zero milliseconds. And everything else works from that. So the next thing that happens is the left speaker hits, it, hits a wall and then it goes into, into your um, ear and the right ear speaker hits the right wall and it hits the ceilings. Then you're going to hear the sound from the right speaker hitting the left wall and what you end up with is a complete mess. So as you can imagine, what we're trying to do here is a couple of things. If anything that hits your ears within 20 milliseconds and 20 dBs, we call it 20 20 rule, that is basically going to interfere with your stereo imaging and it creates a situation called comb filtering. Basically, your, mu your brain can't comprehend all the different sounds and separate them like they're meant to do. What we, obviously, because this isn't just stuff we make up, um, we have some nice graphs to show you. And this first one is an example. Was on the left hand side, you've got the dBs. So it starts at zero where that blue line is and it goes down um, to, to minus 60. And on the bottom axis, we have a millisecond. So we're interested in the one that goes to 20 milliseconds and anything under 20 dBs. All of these here are first reflection points. And that means that that's those sounds hitting your ears within 20 milliseconds. So what we're trying to do is we put in a treatment in the way and it absorbs it and it stops that hitting you in, in those 20 milliseconds and basically improves your stereo imaging and stops that comb filtering happening. You also notice is that the rest of the ones after 20 milliseconds also started to reduce once we put the treatment in. The reason for that is that they're echoes, so they've also got a, a bit of treatment. So here we are, same scenario, we put up our panels. There's our direct sound, and this is our reflections hitting off the panels. And a couple of examples for you now. Just, this is just a studio here where it's got, some, it's got the ceiling treatment and on the left and the right. The next section to look at, and again, this is no particular order, is we call this the rear side walls. This isn't the back wall. These are the area that's potentially behind you on the side of at the back of the room. And there's a couple of different ways of, uh, of treating this. You can either absorb or you can diffuse. When you absorb sounds, you're basically changing the sound energy via friction, pretty much, into... Uh, heat and just basically stopping it dead. What diffusion does is it breaks up those same sound waves and it scatters it back into the room. We, we, it really is a personal choice when it comes to diffusion against absorption in these type of positions. What diffusion can do as well is it can deceive your ears orally into making the room sound larger and some people really enjoy that. The other thing is, is it perhaps you're quite happy with the highs and mids, you think it's quite lively, you're enjoying the sound. So you may want to, but you don't want reflections, you don't want flutter echo. And what flutter echo ultimately is, is just any flat surfaces where the sound can bounce off against each other. And that's what you where you get your echo. So it could be the floor and the ceiling, 
for example. It could be the sidewalls. You've got a lot of glass in there. A lot of modern buildings are very, very hard surfaces now. And this is breaks it up. So if you want to keep the liveliness, but you want to stop the echo, then you might use diffusion. We also use a lot of products now, which includes both of them, um, which is, is another option for you. And because just to come another couple of more examples here, there's a couch at the back, and you can see they've got um, diffusion in this case on the sidewalls. So moving on to the back wall, this is a really, really important aspect of uh, when you come to treat your room. This is what we talked about earlier. This is why I want to get it as far back as possible. On this little picture here, what we've got is we've got a absorber surrounded by two diffusers. Again, it's a, it's a preference. If you're going to use diffusion, there's different types of diffusion, and a lot of it's to do with how deep the wells are. They're all mathematically worked out so that they scatter in an even um, way. So what you, go, you do need quite often, if you sat right against the back wall, you can't necessarily use diffusion because most diffusers will need about one and a half meters to treat. But this is, this is such an important part of the room because of all the sounds are hitting that and coming back and creating your nulls and peaks. So if you've got a problem with too much bass, there's, we're going to go on to the second way of treating it in a moment. But the first way of treating it is to treat that back wall. And if you can, uh, you can stop it there with some thick treatment. I normally like to do uh, a combination. I use a, what we call a monster trap, which is at least six inches thick. And we put in the front of it um, a plate called a scatter plate um, so that it actually does a little bit of both. And it, it works very, very well for that type of environment. We've got a couple of examples here. This is a particular favorite with a lovely gold sofa. Um, and uh, this has got an added bonus of some soffits in the corners as well. Soffits are the largest traps we do and go down to 40 hertz. Um, so the biggest place, and most people are probably already aware of this, is the base building corners. Why does it do that? It's because all room modes, all length modes, etc., eventually end in a corner. When we talk about corners, though, don't ever be restricted thinking that corners only mean tri-corners. Every room has 12 corners. Anywhere where a wall or meets a floor or a ceiling is actually a corner. Obviously, if there's a tri-corner, there's going to be a bigger build of a base, so if we can treat it, we do. Um, what I've done again here is I've, I've put in again a few more graphs, so you can kind of get an idea and a feel of how this actually works. So we've, put, we've gone into corners, we've put ourselves some tri-traps in, hoping to get a lot rid of the, the, um, the base. So I've got a graph here. On the left axis, we've got the dBs. dBs is always, you know, is basically how loud that frequency is. Across the bottom, we've got frequency. Just so you're aware, this is only going from 0 to 200 hertz. Normally, when we run one of these tests, we go up to 20,000. But this is just to demonstrate something in the low end. You can also see, because it's a waterfall, on the 3D um, part of it, uh, on, the, on the top corner, we've got the milliseconds. People also, you'll see this sort of thing as well, where people refer, refer to RT60s. So what we're looking for, anything that rings over 300 milliseconds is really is staying in the room a long time, so we're trying to get it under there. So the problems we've got in this room, in, as you can see, we've got a big peak at 70. That's running past 400 milliseconds, and we've also got a big piece at 34. So what we did is we just put some basic corner traps, the most basic ones, into the corners, and then we've run the test again. And you can see what's happened is that the, it's moved backwards and that's because that's, that's it ringing out. So you can see it started to flatten it. In an ideal world, that would be completely flat, but that's just some corner traps put in a corner, and already you can see that decay time's gone down. So it's starting to be in a, in a reasonable range to stop it echoing around the room. Got a couple more photos for you now. This always amused me. I have no idea why, because you'll see in a minute, but the person apparently decided to take the photograph from stood on top of their couch, which you can see here. Um, and these have got tri traps in the corners. They've got thick monsters on the back wall. Um, you see, obviously, it's a small room that they're, they're working in, so they've had to put a lot of trapping in there. So just to give a slight recap of where we are so far, this is uh, just a, a 3D model of a room. So we've got on the back wall, we've got a mixture here of diffusion and monsters. In all our corners, we've used tri traps, just being corner traps because they fit neatly into the corners. On the rear walls, we have um, some diffusion. Um, and then on the front part, we've got some reflection panels. The one area that I've not specifically talked about, and it's because this is where it starts to get more complex, is the front wall. You know we talked about SBIR? 
Sometimes you can't, you can move your speakers until you can just spend days moving them back and forth and it makes no difference. That's when we'll start to consider treating that front wall. We may put some thick panels. You normally need something at least four inches behind, but um, you don't want to do something too thin. So if we can't actually solve your problems with uh, SBIR, then that's where we may start to put um, panels there. So just um, if you're interested, there's a, there's a little bit more to the presentation yet, but this slide's here, so I'll tell you about it. If you're interested in a little bit more about um, the education side of, of acoustics, on our website, you can go to education. We've got lots of short videos. It tells you and recaps what we've talked about here. And if you want to get into it a little bit more, you can go into some acoustic primers um, and that type of uh, side of things. And it's um, basically, it's just designed. What we believe in at uh, uh, GIK is you know, this isn't, it is a science, and you need to know as much about it as you possibly can, because it is, um, you know, it is quite daunting when you first come to it. I remember when I first came to it years ago, and I, I just couldn't get my head around what now seems to just come naturally to us. So it's got lots of information there. Um, and if you're ever unsure, you can ask us. We're always happy. We go onto forums to discuss this type of thing all, all the time. So a couple more areas we've done for you. One of it is in our products, we particularly use rock wool. Now, we're always looking at different materials, so um, there's different reasons for using different types of materials. So we'd, what we've done is here is a foam, foam versus rock wool, and this is just the difference that some products can have. Um, so the first thing we did is we went and bought some foam um, base traps, and we put them into the corners, like you, like you see here. This is our Atlanta demo room again. And then we did the same test with one of our basic uh, base traps. It's a broadband base trap called the 244. It's just four inches thick, and we just placed those in the corners. This is the first time you've seen the SPL uh, um, type of graph, so I'll just explain this one to you. Left axis, we've got decibels again. We normally would expect people, if they was doing their own home testing, and there is software. This software is free off our site, and if you've got the equipment, like you just need an interface and a omnidirectional microphone. Um, which you can pick up pretty, pretty cheap, you can do this. So the, the dBs here is around 60, 70, because that's normal listening dBs. And along the bottom axis, we've got up just on this case, we've just done it to 400 hertz. Again, normally we'd go across the full range, but this is just demonstration. So what this shows us is you've got peaks and nulls uh, in here. So you can see at 68 there, it's at 75 dB. But by the time it gets to 80, it's dropped to 60 dB. That's a drop of 15 dB just between those two things. So what would happen if you was listening to a piece of music, everything at 68 dB, um, 68 hertz in that piece of music will blast at you. And anything at 80, you wouldn't hear at all. And what we try and do in the pro audio world, where it's very, very scientific, we try and flatten that as much as possible. What we're looking for is a, a least variation of dBs between the, the frequencies. So we just did the test. Here we are, we put in some foam wedges. As you can see, the lines remain the same in the lower hertz. And then when you get to about 300, they really start to take effect and it, it starts to take it out. Um, and this is the reason that we use a different material for bass trapping, why we're known for working with low end, for example, is in this particular example, you can see the slightly, it's just started to take some of the dBs off. In, in, the, um, in the different parts. So you can see that where it was um, right up 75, it's only now at 72. And this is kind of what we're working at. We treat the rooms, we're gonna try and get it flat, we're gonna get that decay time down, we're gonna remove early reflections. And what you, you end up with is a, a listening environment where you hear the true sound of the systems that you bought and the music you, that you um, want. I've just got, I'll just flick through because we, we don't have uh, great times. So these are just the same waterfall graphs showing you the same type of thing. This is um, my favorite part of, of the summarization, but I have got a uh, just a second. So I didn't mention when we went through first reflections, but if you want to know how to find, oh, I better not push through some people's faces, how to find your first reflection points, then this, the mirror trick is a simple way to do it. There is a video on the website, but the basic concept of it is, is you get a friend if you've got one. If not, it's gonna be a little bit harder. You get a friend to move the mirror down the wall. Imagine the wall was here and this was actually the speaker. You'd move it down like this, and as soon as this gentleman here, for example, could see the podium in the mirror, can you? Yeah, there. You'd write a little X on the mark onto, on the wall, and then we would do the same with the speaker on the other side, and you put the X there, and that's where you treat. With a... Um, 
with the ceiling, it's a lot easier. We really just go for halfway in between you and the, the sound source, and we try and cover as much towards the sound source as we can. So the last section, myths. The first myth, and I'm sure a lot of you know about this one, is bookshelves, record collections, or any other random things that you may want to put on the wall. And when I say random things, I see it all the time on forms. I've got an old fence, I'm going to put it on the wall. You, you, can, you can put anything on a wall, and it will, to an extent, scatter things. The reason we're saying it's a myth is that we have diffusion, and we have, um, it's mathematically worked out to have an even scatter. If you put anything on a wall, you've absolutely no idea what it's going to do. If you put a bookcase there, books do not absorb sound. They hardly scatter it. They may do something, but you don't know what it's going to do. And, and the, the, the art of acoustics and the uh, treating your room is that we're trying to control the sound, not just add rand and random elements into it. This is a particular favourite. This is the egg carton. So we've got a lovely uh, studio here, completely filled with uh, egg cartons. It's an interesting that myth is the egg carton. I only can imagine it's because Aurelex, as some of you may be familiar with, um, obviously brought out a foam that looks a little bit like egg cartons. There is a brilliant use for egg cartons, and I'm sure most of you know what it is, is um, they are, it's for holding eggs in. When it comes to acoustics, they're absolutely useless. Because they, they're just not thick enough to absorb, they're not going to diffuse anything. They, you know, they have a purpose, it's for holding eggs. This next one is curtains. Putting curtains up and actually it stopping and really reflecting, it needs to be really, really thick. We don't make... Um, we don't make um, bass traps really thick just because we think they look nice. There's a purpose and it's the way that sound's absorbed. If you're going to put curtains up and you really want to, make sure you do buy the thickest you can, maybe with a couple of linings, etc., etc. This next one's a bit harder for me to demonstrate, but it's my all-time favorite, and one day it's going to be my ticket out of here, I think. And it's called It's Sound Proofing or Sound Isolation. You cannot buy a panel wherever anyone tells you that will stop you having a noisy neighbor or stop you irritating your neighbors. If the only thing we ever recommend to people, the ringers of all time can say, my, my neighbor's really noisy, what can you do? And I, I suggest go around with a bottle of wine and have a chat with them. Because there is absolutely nothing you can do in that sense. You need building work. If I could invent the soundproofing panel, I would be a millionaire. I've just got a couple of minutes. I'll give you one quick example of, of what we, 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 we say mean about this. Is there was a, a company that I had on the internet. Um, they said that they'd invented a soundproof panel. And to demonstrate it, what they did is they took a drummer and they put the drummer in the middle of the desert and they isolated them from the floor by putting them on some crates. And then they took a large airtight box and they put the box on top of the drummer and you couldn't hear the drummer playing anymore. There's a couple of theories that I have about this. My first one is that the drummer's dead. Because if you put an airtight box on top of anybody and leave it long enough, they're not going to last very long. But the simple fact is, is the reason that they're saying it works is because it's airtight. It's not the material you're using. So if you want to stop your neighbors or you want to stop annoying your neighbors, you need to look at actually doing some building work um, and actually looking at you know, an expert in that sense. So uh, thank you very much for listening to it today. If you've got any more questions, we're here at the show for all, uh, all weekends. We're over in Hall 4 um, at T13, which is uh, Tina Turner Street. Um, points for the first one who, who says simply the best, which every time I post on uh, um, Facebook, I seem to get. Um, and we're happy to talk over your rooms. We do do, one of the big things we do do is free advice. It's uh, you know, the best thing we can recommend to anybody is a couple of things you really need to do. If you buy any acoustic treatment from anyone, and the companies here are all reputable companies, they will have test results on the site. Make sure they have test results that don't just have graphs, because I could draw you a graph saying mine was brilliant. Uh, ours, for example, has the full reports from um, Salford University, where we get everything tested, or Riverbank in the US. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, Always take the free advice that any manufacturer does because we don't want to sell you something that isn't going to work or you don't need. We want to sell something that's actually going to you know, enhance your listening experience. Stop fatigue, just generally have a good time. We're not here to you know, just make money selling you something on the wall. It's all about making sure that it's, it's really good. So thank you for your time. Thanks.